want to welcome all of you for being here for our second session of Deploying Yourself. Uh, my name is Adriano Pianesi and uh, I am uh, really happy today to talk to you about authenticity, self, role and a lot of uh, other very important information. Um, the uh, want to give you an overview of what we're going to do today and so uh, in order to do this, I want to use again those cards that uh, you have received as we were preparing for this course that identify a little bit of the key important messages and topics that we want to share with you. And as you see on the screen, I already put there the cards that we touched on last time. Leadership, purpose, source of energy and bandwidth. Uh, today we're going to focus our attention on loyalties, repertoire, default, role, self, and tuning. And, you know, by the way, just in case, um, we have been working on this concept of deploying yourself. And just so we remember what we said briefly last time when we talked about leadership and deploying yourself is that there is a lot of confusion that people normally mix up the work of leadership with the tools that we use for leadership and the hands they will do the work and uh, um, we pointed out that one thing is the work one thing is, is work on the tools and another one is working on the hands and that um, if we want to assess your ability to create change within yourself and your and others we need to understand that deploying yourself is centered on a different idea and is uh, we talk about yourself just as the unit of analysis but we know that leadership does not express itself that way we're not saying here the leadership is personal uh, instead what we're saying is that we are starting from the lens of the personal um, and that we are saying that leadership happens at that intersection between the inner work and the outer work. And so it's really hard to say that we talk about personal leadership as separated from the leadership in the world, because, you know, that is really the present, you know, uh, our work of increasing self-knowledge, making changes to ourselves is truly all we got is that now moment where actually the inner work comes together with the outer work. So today we continue this journey um, and before we do it, uh, as, we f as our talk is about self and authenticity, before we start, I would like to ask you to do something in the next few minutes. And the first thing is this, I would like in the chat room to enter at least five lines of text to introduce yourself. So this would be kind of the introduction that you would do if we would pass the microphone in a meeting and you would say, hi, my name is, you know, that kind of introduction. So let me give you a moment to actually fill this introduction in so that you can actually write down the five lines that you would use to introduce yourself to this group. Let me give you some time to do it. And um, at the end of this, uh, don't hit enter yet. Write it down, but don't hit ent enter yet. Go ahead and... Uh, Enter those few lines that you would do if you were to introduce yourself uh, with a group. Professor? Yes. So introduce ourselves to a group in a, in a professional setting? Yeah. That's right, in a professional setting, in this, this setting, that this setting is right now. So introduce yourself like you would in a regular group, uh, as you would do any time that, you know, you, are in, you introduce yourself and you talk about who you are and what you do. So go ahead and write those few lines uh, to introduce yourself. And don't need to enter yet, just a few lines to share with us uh, this is, we can say, a professional setting, maybe a bit more informal, but still a professional setting. And we are sharing with others, you know, some 
Something that we often do when we are in those kind of settings, in those kind of situations. Okay, at this point, go ahead. Don't worry if it's not perfect, if they're misspelling, we're fine with that. Go ahead and hit enter, please. Thank you. Perfect. Hi, my name is Gail, my name is Marcus, my name is An Angel, my name is Jimmy Lou, my name is Cindy. My Perfect. And, you know, we are actually describing ourselves in a professional setting and we are sharing with others a little bit of things that we say so um, about ourselves when we are actually introducing ourselves in a group. Now, I, I thank you for this and I see additional input is coming. This is, you know, kind of uh, what we normally say, you know, in the US, normally there are those rounds, especially um, of, in which we introduce yourself. We normally keep kind of a written script uh, in our mind about sharing who we are and what we do and what is our work. And now I would like to do something uh, a little different, and if you allow me to. Um, I would like to do the same exact thing that you have been doing uh, so far. Thank you, Nia. Uh, thank you, Joel. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Jackie. Now, I would like for you to do something a bit different. I would like to do to drop the script. This is probably what we normally say when we are in those situations. I want to, again, introduce yourself. Hi, my name is... But this time, I want you, you know, to write in a way that you don't normally do. So write something different. Uh, you're still introducing yourself to this group, but you are not writing the usual script, the one that you usually use in your own, uh, in similar situation. Again, do not enter uh, yet. Hi, my name is, and you write something about yourself, which this time is different, is not the script. It's something completely different than that. It's an entire other, we may say, maybe it's script number two for some of you, or maybe it's an entire new made up uh, thing that you would like to say when you introduce yourself. Let me give you another moment as you write this down. And as you're typing, now go ahead and hit enter, please. Hit enter and let's see what we have this time. This is a different script, very different script. Maybe we have added some information, maybe we have taken out some information, we have actually added a different side of ourself. I mean, the important part, and this is really the kind of part that I want to point out, that we are making sense of who we are in a variety of way. And this making sense of who we are is truly, you know, a way for us to, uh, to say who we are. Um, we have kind of a sort of way uh, to answer this question, who are you? And we make sense of this through observation, of course. We know something about ourselves. We know we have some interpretation about uh, our stories, our way to make sense of what we know is true about ourselves. And then, of course, we have actions, those interventions. You can recognize here the ladder of inference in a kind of more simplified way. But what I think it's really important here is the fact that when I ask you to introduce yourself and when you ask you who you are in a group or when I even ask you to do it twice, what you're doing is you're drawing from what you know about yourself to interpret this data in a different way. You're providing me maybe a different image. Um, some of you are sharing first a very professional image and then in the second one they're sharing maybe a different one. It's not that those are two different person. Those are two different perspective on that same person based on those observation. So we have one story often, 
when we are there and that's the one we use. What I have asked you to do today and what we will do a lot throughout this lecture is to talk about multiple interpretation, different ways to actually see the same thing for the sake of finding more freedom and autonomy and also creativity of recreating who we are in order to deploy ourselves freely. When we make sense of ourselves, we can assess each of those elements that can define who we are. Of course, through different life experience, we have a different almost ability in those different areas. Maybe we have a black belt in our physical uh, sense of who we are. Maybe we have a yellow belt in uh, you know another area of those. But all those elements, of course, are what they make our capacity uh, to lead and to live. And, you know, in, in, not in the abstract, we're talking about matching life reality with the capacity to deal with reality. And, you know, we have probably learned some of those things from things that have happened to us. So we have talked uh, about the fact that um, we have a different capacity. We could reflect and that we can say easily that in life, some of those capacity has been enhanced by what happened to us. In other cases, that's, that's not been the case. So in all those cases, we may clearly say that we have been, you know, out, authentically become who we are because of things that have happened to us and that have forced us somehow to embrace or develop some capacity or another capacity. Now, um, uh, we feel that we are not just ourselves in one of those areas. We feel that we are ourselves authentically in all those areas. Now, um, this is a very interesting concept. We think that deep down, uh, we know who we are and we actually uh, are very attentive at being authentic toward, toward ourself. And you know, one thing that I want to talk about is how authenticity and the concept of authentic self bring a, is all, its own problem. I'm not a big fan of authenticity, I want to tell you, because I think that he has a lot of danger. Um, I think the way we normally think about authenticity is poses a lot of problem. And, you know, I want to make sure that we don't run into those problems as we discuss the topic today. I coach people in those moments, you know, in which uh, they are between career or in different moments of change. And, you know, those moments in which what you got here won't get you there. And when you are in those moments, whatever made you successful in the past may not be the same thing that will make you successful in the future. And so what's, what's really tricky about those transitions is the fact that we do think that there is this idea of who we are and that um, those transition points, um, they become tricky because it's not that those skills are hard to learn is that we kind of have this sense of who we are, which is based on the authenticity. And so um, it, it becomes almost an obstacle to, to what we are trying to do. So let me be more clear, introducing the concept of repertoire. Sometime the old repertoire, the old skills, the old things that we know how to do, they become no longer very helpful to us. And, but we are stuck with that identity, the idea that I am an engineer, the idea that I am an academic, the idea that I am a person that likes this, the idea that I am part of that kind of uh, knowledge, that our identity is stuck almost with a certain repertoire. What is a repertoire? It's nothing more than a range of capacity in which we have comfort and skills. It's so much comfort and so much skill that we identify with those skills. And so we become one. I want to give you an example here. Otherwise, this is a very abstract. Uh, one of my clients, well, let's call her Liz, is the kind of prototypical engineer. She, she used to lead by numbers. Um, she... Um, now she's at the moment where she has been promoted and when she does meetings she needs to do much more than just you know lead by numbers she need maybe to share a personal story 
or to actually talk about things in a larger perspective. Now, this might be hard for Liz to do because it feels almost like manipulation. So uh, she's stuck in a sense because uh, if authenticity means, you know, to be true to yourself, Liz think that if she acts like that, she's not going to be herself. And so um, this is important because it feels like manipulation to Liz to actually start the meeting in a different way. Crack a joke at the beginning of a presentation or ask a person, what did you do over the weekend? Is not her nature, is not what she would naturally do. So, uh, I mean, one definition is being true to yourself. Another definition is being true to your values. And, you know, the, the problem here is true to yourself, but to yourself today or to yourself that will come. That's the question. So does being authentic condemns you to be always who you are without any difference? I mean, this is an important problem. Um, oftentimes, we are true. We can be true to an aspirational self. And now in the case of Liz, she doesn't care about being true to an aspirational self. Uh, she is convinced that, you know, she's not going to do what most of people do. And so um, she feels that if she does that, she will have no sincerity. And then bring us to this concept, you know, sincerity, you know, it's Latin word. Uh, it means without walks, because they used to take walks and fix statues. They were actually defective um, during Roman times. And so what happened is that say that somebody is sincere means that there were no walks to actually fix their face. And so the idea here is that sincerity is not really, uh, is showing your true self, who you really are. But for Liz, showing, doing those kind of things is like playing games. Now, the authenticity that I showed you earlier, another definition is being true to your values. Now, the problem here is that for Liz, um, she... When she, when she studied at engineering school, the values of being sociable and crack a joke and ask a person was not a value that she actually was working. It feels like it's not substance to her. And, you know, the problem here is that this is ingrained because she learned it at engineering school where I'm sure they didn't have a course on the art of telling a good story or the art of actually being creative when you start a meeting. The problem is she no longer work as an engineer. She needs to move into a bigger repertoire. So what's happening to Anna, to Liz, sorry, is now this issue, this authenticity paradox. Um, it, it, it shows how tricky it really is for all of us to hold a sense of self. Because uh, if you got here and won't get you there moment, you need to work towards becoming somebody else in order to make, get to the next level of your life. But it's either one or the other. You, you bottom line define yourself, uh, your sense of self become an obstacle to adapting to what the world demands. And this is problematic. And what we do in those situations is that we create a false trade-off. It's almost like it's either being yourself of being effective in a certain job or position. But the truth is, and I hope that this can give you a sense about how problematic is this idea of authenticity if we actually get stuck into this kind of mindset. You know, the thing is, and this is how we get out of this, you are not your current repertoire. And even if you feel morally justified, and we even do it in the name of integrity, of actually being true to yourself. The truth is here that um, you are not your current repertoire. If you want to move up, have more success, change things that so far needs to be changed, you are not. Well, nobody's asking you to sacrifice your value or sacrifice your integrity. The thing is that the situation at some level evoke a version of yourself that is rigid and that is not flexible 
and is very conservative and very cautious. And, you know, you stick to it because you feel morally justified. You would feel that you would actually lack integrity if you were to make some changes. Now, can you see how then in authenticity is really an issue in this situation? So deploying yourself, um, you know, keys to deploy yourself better uh, is, you know, what is it that we're learning in this, in this course? We're learning to deploying yourself as a way to answer differently to those questions. Who are you and what's your job? Because, you know, of course you have an answer to those questions. You're supposed to have an answer. The question is, is that answer keeping you to developing yourself and growing toward a better integration and the next version of you? Because the truth of the matter is that you have one self, but you have many roles. And when I say this, you know, what I mean is, yes, your repertoire is important. And your default is important because, I mean, what is the default if not what you would ultimately na naturally say? A routine, an habitual response to stimuli, things that you do naturally without even having to explain. Yes, default and repertoire are very important to you and they're founding element of who you are. But the truth is that you have many roles. You're not just yourself. You are many roles. You play different roles in your life. And those roles come from the different thing that you do in your job, but also, for example, naturally, from the groups that exist in your life. Why? Because um, roles are given to you even in your family. Maybe you were the person that was mediating conflict, automatically given that role by your family without nobody assigning it to you officially when you were younger, or you were the person that would always crack a joke or say something nice when there was a situation. Maybe in your organization, you were assigned a new role um, uh, to be accountable for the bottom line if you were promoted vice president, maybe before you were the controller. You know, but what I'm trying to say here is that there are many different roles that you can play in your, in your life. Now, are you... Who are you? Are you the spouse, the lover, the friend, the volunteer, the constituent, the parent, the boss? Who are you? Those are all different roles. Now, the interesting part is that in doing those roles, you have freedom, but not absolute freedom. Because, of course, the role comes with some a certain job description. So this pie chart gives you a sense of all the different roles that you can play but you don't ex act exactly the same way in each of those different roles, of course. But the important thing is that whatever role you're playing at any time, that role does not represent you all of who you are, even if it feels that way. Now, this is good because it cannot possibly be the whole picture of you. There are many roles that you play and those roles, they all come together. If their role doesn't work, or if your job didn't work out, or maybe if you have some trouble here, it's important that you know that you are not your roles, that you are playing their roles. And whatever role you're playing, it's not you who didn't work, but it's the performance of yourself within that role. Now, this seems kind of an interesting concept to old, but think about it. Um, when you think in role in those terms, you become much less vulnerable to taking things personally if your performance in that role does not work out, either in the moment or sometime. And when you don't take things personally, that doesn't mean that they don't hurt. It doesn't mean that the experience is not bad. But you become on your way to learning about yourself at a deeper level, understanding that even if you put your heart and soul into your role as a parent, for example, still, the role is not the same as yourself. Is what you're doing at that particular moment in time, hopefully with the purpose of making things better for your family, organization, and community. So, this is important. When you make a distinction between the roles that you play, 
you gain some kind of emotional strengths that allow you to ignore personal attack of your opponent and work towards deploying yourself and doing your changes much more strongly. So what can I say here? Authenticity, yes, is about yourself. But the truth is there are multiple roles that you inhabit. And there are multiple ways to deploy yourself in each of these roles. I would like to give you a moment uh, to actually give you a breakout room, a br very brief breakout room, to think about what are all those different roles that you play in your life. Let's do a breakout room of four, four or five people and let's give you five minutes to reflect on what are those roles. What are those different roles that you play in your life? And what do you notice as you see all those different roles? Let's start the breakout room. Thank you. We're back in our main room and I'm glad that you had a chance to discuss this. And, you know, what was something that came to mind as you were discussing your roles? What was the one insight that you had as you were doing this? Very briefly, because this is a lecture. I'm not supposed to ask you what you're thinking. I have to lecture, lecture, lecture. Go ahead, please. And you know what is the answer to that? My personal answer is to just do it. <laughs> because if you keep thinking about it you know you will never actually find your way my personal experience in those kind of situation is not fake until you make it because you're you cannot fake anything you have to be yourself but you have to find that that chord within yourself you have to find within yourself that kind of part of thomas that is actually a bit different a bit not like that and there are a lot of insight that you can get from the exercise that we're doing now, because I'm sure there is a role in the many that you're playing right now where that is more real for you. You know, we're not talking here about not realizing who we are. We're simply talking about uh, understanding that who we are is a process. For example, if I were to ask you, uh, if you have changed more in the past, then you will change in the future. I mean, there are psychological studies uh, that proves that people are convinced uh, normally that their major changes are behind themselves, that they have actually changed a lot in the last 10 years. But guess what? This is who I am now. And more or less, I'm going to be like this. In my TED talk, I was talking about what would happen if you were to to meet the 10 version, 10 year younger than yourself version. What would you tell that person if you meet them in the street? I mean, here's the deal. You are not finished. Otherwise you will be getting into a museum under some kind of liquid, you know? You are alive and that means that you are becoming. And that is the actual work. And that is what, you know, we have been trying to share here that this is an enthusiastic problem, a, pro, a, a process of self-growth. And all you need to do is prevent to keep those kind of, uh, prevent yourself from limiting yourself because of a very rigid idea of who you are. So that is really my job, Thomas. Unfortunately, I cannot give you an answer, but I would love. That was good enough. I think that was a good answer. No, no, but I would love to continue the conversation after <laughs> eight o'clock when <laughs> I will go back into my normal, uh, more participatory self, and I will actually talking about role switching back and forth. And you know what we are trying to really point out here is what did you discover as you read and understood your roles within this exercise. Thank you, Thomas. What, let's continue the conversation. Anyone else, what, what did you discover as you discuss your roles?
Anyone? Because it seems to me to cover really what, you know, the, the fact that it's still you. And this is a little bit of what I'm trying to get here, that you cannot deploy yourself without a role. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say for some of you. And, you know, in, in some of my leadership courses, I tell my students, oh my gosh, what if you discover you're not the right person for changing your organization? Well, you can still do, give a contribution, but what you're sharing here about yourself to Jay is really important because in that now moment, we bring ourself, but we also bring a role with whatever limitation that that role has. What I mentioned earlier, you might remember, is that that role is truly who you are in that moment though. Mm -hmm. Not in, and that is why we have, this creates our ability for resilience and to bounce back from whatever issue that we may have in those situations. Yes, yes. And those are, those, I mean, that's why we're here. I mean, the truth is what I was telling you the other day, we need to change the world. I mean, the world is changing. And that's why what I was telling you is that in a, in a way, what we are all about in this conversation and in this concept is how can we put the right foundation for us to do this goal, this work well. And the right foundation is for Cindy, Angel, Catherine, and uh, Jimmy Lou to think, oh, you know what? I failed in that change, in that role, in that situation. But guess what? I'm ready to redeploy myself next year based on that knowledge, based on that understanding of it, a better understanding of what my role was, what my limitation were, and in order to actually make a change. And that is why we continue to analyze again and again those concepts here. Because when we realize that those ideas, those roles are nothing more than a proxy to who we are for real, then we gain that freedom and emotional strength to say, yes, I was a terrible boss. But then, you know what? I come back home, I switch back into this role of a parent, and I'm learning a lot in that role of a parent. It's still me. I'm not a failure as an individual. I am a failure as a boss. In this particular situation, I'm not even a failure. I have failed in this particular situation. And, you know, again, this idea that role that you're playing does not represent all of who you are is incredibly liberating for people that want to change the world. Because one of the issues that group people like us have a lot is burnout. We actually dedicate ourselves into changing the world. And when it doesn't work out, we judge ourselves harshly. And so I'm asking you to judge yourself for that particular performance within that role. And this is a big change for many of us. And this way we are able to see that the notion of authenticity can be thrown away. We don't care about being authentic because we can become trapped in that idea. Instead, we substitute this notion with the idea of default, repertoires and roles. And those ideas give us a much bigger latitude for change. You know, I have to be honest with you, I'm very pragmatic. If a concept helps me change the world, I use it. If it doesn't help me, I throw it away. Re Authenticity has not helped me change, do any change in any situation where I've been. Instead, when I have embraced my understanding of what is my default today, when I understand what is the limit of my capacity, what I know, my comfort, what is the role that I'm playing right now? Well, that, that's a different story. Because the great news here is there are multiple ways to be yourself. And you are not your repertoire. And you have multiple roles. And therefore, there are multiple ways to be yourself in that roles. 
There are multiple ways to deploy yourself. In some situation, deploying yourself is just come, the best way to deploy yourself come from an understanding. What is the limit of your role? What can your role deploy in that particular situation? What is the limit of my repertoire? What is it that I do not know and need to develop? But without hiding ourselves within this idea of authenticity, no, this is not who I am. Because that is a very rigid way to see who we are. That way, the notion of authenticity is holding us back rather than pushing up towards the next level of iteration of who we are. I want to talk to you about another concept, which I think literally resonates because it, it do resonates the concept of tuning which is really a very interesting metaphor from music the idea that frequency that matches your own are amplified now think about it there are some words that triggers you there are some themes that actually you immediately resonate to maybe out of personal experience out of what you know about that that we could spend, you know, a couple of hours talking about tuning because tuning is really how do you consciously or unconsciously resonate towards, you know, external stimuli. It's a funny story. I'm not supposed to share it, but I do anyway. I, I am an immigrant, of course, from Italy. And, you know, I had to go through the, let's say, uh, antiquated immigration procedures that this country have in order to make to naturalize you. So I had to do weird uh, vaccination for diseases that disappear in 1905, but I have to do it anyway. Regardless, um, at one point of my life as a consultant a few years ago, I was asked to work for the Department of Homeland Security. I have to be honest with you. I had a first reaction there there was a reaction that I reacted naturally to my tuning, to my life experience. I, I eventually did the work because I thought it was a, an incredible experience for me to um, do what I'm preaching. But the truth is, we do have words, situation, topic, or things that really drive us crazy or that we immediately react, positively or negatively, sometimes not even knowing about. And I want to ask you, if you could, to take an inventory of what are those words, those topics, those, for instance, one person might be extremely sensitive to a topic on this area, of topic on another area. And I'm not asking you because I want you to delete those influences. Again, I want you to simply embrace your own tuning, understand what, what that is. What are those words that really, really get under your skin? Again, the topic is simply prepare yourself for the hard work of change and realize that it's easy sometimes to react and not to do what is the right thing to do just because our tuning made us do so. As we move toward you know, another end of our lecture, I want to briefly introduce the concept of loyalties. This is a very interesting idea, which I think would be uh, a great topic of conversation uh, and between you as peers, if you decide to continue this work of this lecture through meeting after this group. Loyalties are a very important concept. I think that um, in, in few words, those are feelings of obligation that we feel. And, but I want to give you an example because if I were to ask you, how did you learn to deploy the role that you're deploying right now? I am 100% positive that there was a person that taught you how to do that role, how to play that role. There was a person that either directly or indirectly told you this is how you act as a, a you can fill the role. And so that's the reason why the concept of loyalty is important because how you deploy your role 
is often influenced influenced by your loyalties. Let me give you an example, showing you a loyalty map, which is the key, whose idea, basic ideas is that our behaviors, our beliefs, our ideas and values, way of doing things in life, they don't come from thin air. They don't come from thin air. They come from someone who has taught us about those things sometimes in our lifetime. And so if I deploy my own role, for example, as a boss, I am sure that I can go back and do a personal archeology span and think, who taught me about being a boss at work? And I can easily identify that, for instance, my dad told me, you got to be decisive and make up your mind fast when you, when you are the boss. Or maybe my favorite president said something you know, that I still resonates to me and then I think all the time when I supervise people. Or maybe you had an MBA professor that told you that people need psychological safety in order to perform at their best. And that as a direct influence, that message, almost that direct quote still resonates with you, still is with you. Now, you now go to a training class and a professor is asking, the trainer is asking you to change your way to supervise. It's gonna be really hard for you to disappoint your first boss, to disappoint your friend Ted, to disappoint your dad or your MBA professor and switch and change the way you supervise. You see what loyalties are, are those feel of obligation that are connected to who we are and make us say, this is where I learned this from. This is who I am about when I play this role. So this is interesting because what this is point out is to the fact that there are still influences in our life that we may be aware or less aware when we play any of those roles there is somebody alive or dead that still has an influence on us. And I want to clarify that this is not an attempt to erase your past. This is an attempt to become more aware of your past, to become fully cognizant of who are those big influences in my life that are determining still today how I supervise. I use this tool of the loyalty map also not just for this kind of work and understanding, for example, we, who taught you about a specific role. I also use it for issues in general because I found with many of my clients that when there is an issue, there are often lessons that we have learned in the past from someone that become an obstacle to the resolution of that issue. And being stuck is nothing more than understanding what are those influences that are still at play. Many of my clients struggle with conflict and confrontation. And if you think about it, how is that come alive? How do you actually have this trouble with conflict and confrontation? If you go back in your life, for example, and you study that those people, my friend, my mother, my aunt, my second grade teacher gave me some lesson about conflict. I remember still the direct quote of what they told me when it came to conflict. For example, my aunt told me you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. That's a lesson that maybe is still at play for me today. So no wonder I have difficulty with conflict and confrontation. My friend Jessica taught me a lady never argues in public. Of course, I'm gonna have trouble to deal with conflict and confrontation because those people are people I care about. I'm loyal. I don't wanna betray themselves and I don't wanna, I don't wanna betray them and I don't wanna betray myself. But changing my style of dealing with conflict and confrontation border on putting those loyalties at risk. And so the concept of loyalties, it's really important because mapping loyalties 
is ultimately another way to understand from whom those behavior, beliefs, and way of doing things come from. They didn't come from thin air. They came from somebody. And if we map it, we can learn and understand who we are much more deeply. And we can evaluate the influence of those way of, of being in our way of leading. And we can redefine who we are and how we lead. Ultimately, mapping loyalties, and this is the loyalty map that I will share with you after the class, is an attempt for you to truly come in contact with who taught you about a role, or in general, about who was there for you to teach you about a specific topic. And is their influence still at play for you in those topic. The concept that we discuss today are concepts that I consider very important to, your, to a full understanding of your sense of self. We have discussed the idea of the fault and repertoire. The idea that we, if we get rid of this concept of authenticity, which sometimes can keep us trapped in an idea of who we are, we can embrace instead the multiplicity of, of repertoire that we can develop, the multiplicity of role that we play in our life, and the multiplicity of loyalties that actually were the teacher, the people that gave us some learning about those concepts. The idea of tuning is also very important, and I hope that you will consider it as we continue this work of deploying yourself. And as we get to eight o'clock, I would be happy to open up uh, the conversation and uh, answer your question on whatever you would like to ask. This was our second session of deploying yourself. I uh, want to share for you just in case and those that needs to go, of course, Feel free to leave and we will see you next week at 7 p.m. Eastern time on the same link. But those are the concepts we have discussed today. And I would be really happy to continue the conversation. If you are, there is any question, I will be here. I'm always here after eight o'clock and happy yeah. to address whatever input or information or question you might have. Beautiful question, TJ. Beautiful question that goes at the heart of what the uh, of what the what deploying yourself is all about. Because what what you're saying ultimately here is how do we refashion those loyalties when those loyalties do not serve us anymore? You know, I'm an immigrant from the United States. My grandmother um, lived in a small town. I uh, was the mom of my mom, of my father. You know, I love her to death. I love her to death. I mean, she was incredible. I was the first son, um, and uh, she was shamefully uh, preferring me over my sister. I mean, it was like ridiculous. It was, it was, <laughs> it was embarrassing to be honest. I used to spend time with her, and she would tell me about incredible stories. But my grandmother was racist. You know, one time, why? Because she lived in a small town. She never had anybody uh, who had a different complexion color ever uh, meet her. And so one time we talked about this and she had a, a weird reaction to the fact that I was telling her about this. So I don't think that my grandmother was racist. My grandmother had no concept of what doesn't mean to live with people of a different race because of personal experience. So this is not an answer, but is a first attempt to actually help you in this process that is essential in the life of leadership uh, if we want to deploy ourselves to change the world, which is how do we refashion our loyalties? Understanding what is required by the situation understanding what is required by the situation. You know, I went to 
for my work, I traveled to Kuwait uh, very recently. And as soon as I arrived in Kuwait, I was asked provocatively in a, in a meeting, uh, why do I think is there is the right idea for Kuwait to allow women to vote? And what I asked is, uh, this is not whether or not I like or I don't like for women to vote. I have an opinion. You may know it, but I don't. I didn't share it. What I said is, what does Kuwait need? Needs? What does Kuwait requires at the moment? Does it require to exclude fifty percent of its population or not? That is the question, and I think, in a sense, this is a way to answer you, TJ. What does your life in this moment requires? That's the big question. I don't think that we can live betraying our loyalties. I don't think that that's a life that I would ever recommend to anyone. But we can refashion our loyalties. I mean, my mom um, uh, and my dad, they taught me a lot of lessons. But they didn't live in the United States, you know. They lived in a different country with different rules and different language spoken and different ideas. And, and they were different people. So I think that it's possible to make that translation with your heart uh, and to actually draw what are the true lessons that can be brought forward from those loyalties that we are now supposedly no longer identifying with. TJ, your question is great. I think refashioning our own loyalties is the work of leadership. Any question of anyone? Any clarification or any curiosity or concept you would like to clarify or any ideas? What did Jay was saying earlier? I mean, sometimes you are a doctor, then there is a phone call, you become a mother, and then you switch back into being a parent, and then you are a spouse, and then you become a you know an applicant for a job, and then you become, I mean. It's not that this is a, a you, but you know, what we're talking about here is the a deeper understanding of what each role brings and a deeper understanding of what is possible within the constraint of that role because we have some freedom. As a mom, you have some freedom, but you don't have all the freedom that you think you have. Uh, I have to break it to you. <laughs> Uh, that, you know, I, I don't know if you have other, other children, Megan, but, you know, my uh, role as a parent is by far the most complex role that I have, uh, you know, embraced since I've been born. I have in my leadership course, when I want to talk about a complex problem or a problem that really cannot be quick to be solved, I often talk about parenting because, yes, there is a book but the book is one thing and the life in front of you and you changing with them and they changing with you, that's very hard to, to put into any rule. And so I, I would say that, you know, uh, you have seen since we started last week that a lot of this has been, yes, very exciting and positive but also has insinuated this idea of complexity in the equation and made it you know, a bit more complex and less uh, straightforward as it used to be. I'm very excited for you, very excited for you. I cannot even begin to say you're on the cusp of one of the most uh, rewarding and an incredible experience in your life. If you didn't do it before, if you is, is the second or third time, that even better. But you know, really incredible. Really, I'm really honored that you want to learn to deploy yourself. <laughs> it's very nice of you. Yeah, I'm a newbie, so this is yeah first oh, one. So thank Fantastic. you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, <laughs> several role bleeds into each other. That is very true. They do not are neatly separated, and it's. It's part of what we're trying to learn here as well. Let's see if there is anyone, uh, any other question or anything you want to ask? If there is not, I want to thank all of you for staying over. 
I look forward to see you next week at 7 p.m. And you will be receiving an email from us with the, the loyalty map and additional information, including a video to explain your loyalty map in case you are interested in filling that up. It's been a great pleasure to spend time with you tonight. I look forward to see you next week.